Ollie and I said no to our only chance of survival. Fact. And we paddle on towards the Faroe Islands. And the fishermen went back to their fishing. And they genuinely believed that they were going to be the last people to see us alive. And they said this to, to the cameras, you know, afterwards. They're like, we thought they were, they were going to die. We thought we were going to be picking up a boat and looking for bodies later that day. Hey George, how are we doing? John, I'm very well, thanks. How are you? Not too bad. Well, great to have you on the show. And I suppose the best place to start is probably with people listening is about yourself and where are you and what have you been doing? <laughs> that is a million dollar question actually, John, right now. Um, because the answer to that is not a huge amount like the rest of the world. <laughs> Anyway, um, uh, my name is George Bullard and I'm a world record-breaking explorer. I've spent uh, basically the last, uh, what are we now, like, I'm now 30, 32, God. And um, since I was 14, really, I've been doing expeditions most years, really. And some of them have broken world records, some of them haven't, some of them have been phenomenal trips and adventures to, uh, like, most corners of the world. And... Um, my mission is to rewild humans. I believe super passionately in the power of the outdoors and the power that Mother Nature can have on all of us, whether that's like spiritually, whether that is emotionally, physically, uh, or mentally. You know, I think all of these aspects, the outdoors can affect you. And I really use the sort of big expeditions as a as a as a a, a, a sort of piece. A, a signature piece which says you know uh this is what george is about this is what he loves and um yeah i've been super fortunate enough to do some really really silly ones and had some ridiculous things happen on them but i've also been fortunate enough to do some very serious ones and uh i guess achieve some pretty i i still can't believe it so by that by those means it's pretty remarkable <laughs> well let's start with the ridiculous ones <laughs> the, I mean the more ridiculous ones I went down to um, down to Antarctica in um, 2008 to go and try and find someone's stove which is quite a niche trip reason to go down to Antarctica Did they ask you to, <laughs> they say they'd lost it and uh, they really wanted it back <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly they were like dude I'm trying to keep my, my eggs and uh, I can't have my avocado on toast without my stove <laughs> no no, it wasn't ridiculous. It was, um, you know, it was a very real, real trip. But we went down there to down to the subantarctic island of South Georgia, which, uh, and we went there to go and try and find uh, Shackleton's stove. And uh, you know, it was a remarkable trip. And uh, it was, it was basically the, the story goes that as Shackleton came, Shackleton came over South Georgia, he went through the Breakwind Gap, which is this remarkable uh, sort of saddle. Uh, right on the backbone of South Georgia, which and South Georgia is a very sort of narrow, thin island, and it's it's home to every single breeding animal um, that's that or land breeding animal that lives in the Southern Ocean. So it's stuffed full of animals, and you know we us humans go there, and we're just we're just like part of the food chain. You know, genuinely feel like you're going to be eaten by something if you cross its path. And uh, anyway, South Georgia is a stunning place. If you ever get the chance to go there, you must. And um, we we are you know reading about Shackleton's story and how apparently when he heard the noise of the whaling or the bells of the whaling station, um, which used which which used to be there, they're, they're now obviously no longer operational. Um, when he heard the sounds, he he ran down the hill and left everything up just beneath the Breakwind Gap on South Georgia, and um, you know nearly a hundred years later, uh, <laughs> we we were. I think how many were us? We must have been. I think we were a team of eight. Team of eight teenagers <laughs> travelled um, a few thousand miles uh, across the Southern Ocean to go and try and pick up Shackleton stove for him and uh, and bring it home. <laughs> so uh, there was a few other like other purposes of the trip, but um, that was, I guess, the more ridiculous one when you put it into into uh, those words. <laughs> oh wow. 
Um, have, have you ever been to South Georgia, John? I have not, no. Um, I, I would love to go. Um, that, as I say, that Shackleton story is an absolutely epic one from his endurance trip. Um, but yeah, uh, on the list, definitely. Get it on that list. Put it on that list for sure. I, I recommend it for like anyone's list. It's it's a remarkable island. And, uh, you know, there was also some some serious projects we did, uh, obviously, within the, within, the, within the expedition. We found a, new, a whole new species of fern. We found, found a new colony of penguins. Um, uh, we did some retake photography, which was pretty shocking, actually, to be, to be honest with you. Uh, retake photography is about as simple as, simple as it comes. Yeah. We found uh, you know, uh, uh, some footage from the archives uh, in the Royal Geographical Society of where, when sort of South Georgia was, was first um, colonised, or first occupied, colonised, lived on, probably is the best word. And um, you know the, the, the pictures of the glaciers, for example, just straightforward, straight up the picture, straight up picture of the glacier. And you know our intention was to go down there and take exactly the same picture once again. So stand in exact on the same, you know, stones that the photographer stood on over a hundred years ago, and take the same picture. And then you can obviously see how the glaciers have changed. And it is it's truly terrifying, actually, how much. Um, the glaciers have retreated. There is no like, there's no beating around that bush. It's 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 truly terrifying. And did you manage to find it? <laughs> um, uh, no, we didn't manage to find Shackleton <laughs> Stone. So it's still there. We were we were actually we were even still there to be found. It's still there to be found. We were even sponsored by by Mine Lab. And I'm pretty sure, don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty sure Mine Lab uh, provide the military, like the army, the British army, with their mine detecting, uh, you know, metal detecting bleepers. I'm pretty, and, and they armed yeah, us yeah. with like quite a few of these. And um, so either we were looking in the wrong place or, or the metal detectors don't work. <laughs> I hope the former, uh, <laughs> for the sake of the British military, but... <laughs> Good. And so that was 2008. And then you finally got into university. Well, so 2000, and that was Christmas 2007 in 2008. And then, um, yep. and then I, I came back from South from the Antarctic and I was giving a talk in, in the, the Royal Geographical Society in London, which is, uh, which is a lovely place. And, um, at that talk i then met someone who simply said to me um do you want to come on an expedition to break the world's longest fully unsupported polar journey in history so in layman's terms no one's ever walked further in a polar region without support and um that was the first time i met this guy and the second and, and because like my brain's quite small and like both both cells were vibrating quite quickly i said yes um, why not? I'm, ge I'm genuinely not lying to you. This is exactly how it happened. I was like, yeah, all right, let's do it. Uh, the second time I met this guy, um, Alex, we were packing our sledges. And the third time I met this guy uh, was in Stansted Airport, um, heading off, heading up to the Arctic. So I got back from Antarctica in, the, in, the, uh, in January. Yeah. And then I left for the Arctic in March. It was quite a quick turnaround. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, straight up to the Arctic for a 113 day long walking journey, covering just under one and a half thousand miles, and it still stands today as the longest unsupported Arctic journey. Um, and yeah, so it's pretty all pretty remarkable, really. Um, okay, and then sort of university life took it took hold, and then post yeah, I mean, uni got took took hold, and. Um, uh, but so did my desire to, to continue going out on expeditions. And so really, I genuinely what I've done is, is use my holidays from school, university, even like work, uh, when, you know, work when I finally got a job, uh, and holidays from that to, to do things which I was, um, you know, proud of and to do things which do adventurous things. And, uh, you know, that lit that led me on all sorts of all sorts of journeys. In two thousand and nine, I guided uh, fifty odd kids in the Amazon rainforest with British exploring. 
in 2010. Um, I cycled across Europe in 2011. Um, I took some kids to um, took some kids up to the Arctic to Svalbard, and that was where the Pooh Rainbow happened in Svalbard, which is quite a funny story. We might come on to that in a minute. <laughs> and then, to, to, I mean, genuinely, mate, we're in 2012, and we've got things like every single year up to 20, well, to 2020 now. Uh, genuinely, oh, wow. so you know we could go on and on, um, but they've been pretty remarkable, really. Uh, so tell us about the poo rainbow. What, what story is that about? <laughs> the famous poo rainbow. Holy smokes! So <clears throat> let me set the scene. Um, yeah, seventy-five people, uh, kids and leaders and guides. So I think there was seventy-five kids or sixty sixty odd kids and fifteen guides. Um, some guys are responsible for science, some of them are more, more responsible for the adventure side of things. And we were living on this beach. I don't know whether you even know, I mean, some of you guys might not know where Svalbard is. It's an archipelago, uh, Norwegian archipelago, uh, about 78 degrees north, due north of Norway, right? And beautiful. The capital's Longyearbyen. It's um, 3,000 people live there. Um, it's, it's really, it's home to the seed bank. Uh, so, you know, on the, just outside Longyearbyen, the main capital city, is this hill. And in the side of the hill is, is literally just a doorway. It's, it's a door, like, like your front door. The doorway goes into the mountain. And, uh, you know, you pull the door open and you enter the world's largest seed bank, where, uh, where seeds from every single species of plant on the world, in, the, in the world are stored. Uh, so it's pretty remarkable uh, as a as a location. It's obviously there's lots of tourism there. People go there to see the Northern Lights, to see polar bears, um, and anyway, this expedition we were uh, again. It was all about youth development, leadership skills. We were there doing like retake photography again in Svalbard. Um, we were doing studies um, around heat exchange and teaching the kids how to climb glass, like ice climb and survive in the Arctic. It's pretty, ex pretty extreme really for, to take, you know, 16 to 21 year olds from a, you know, UK environment and, and into the Arctic. You know, there's lots of training going on beforehand. It's, you know, and so the anticipation, the excitement, the, you know, the, the, almost the nerves of getting there is phenomenal. And, uh, we finally got, got to Longy Burn. We then get on a boat and we have effectively a, almost a day's boat journey um, to, get to, to deliver us onto the beachfront where we were setting up our, our base camp. And um, base camp was literally just a, a big flat beach where we could put up, um, you know, uh, probably 30 odd tents um, by the time you've got all the leaders tents and the mess tents and things. Uh, all in rows for polar bear protection and stuff like that. Um, and obviously all of the loos. And like going to the loo, one of the beautiful things, one of the most beautiful things about adventure, and one of the things I love is that it doesn't matter like, you know, what watch you're wearing. It doesn't matter how big your wallet is, what car you drive. Doesn't matter because uh, you all poo in the same bucket, right? You're all exactly the same. You know, there's no differentiating. There's no like, oh, I can afford the taxi. You can't. You're walking. I'm going to get home five hours before you. None of it, because you know everyone's just the same, and it's a, it creates a beautiful dynamic within a, within a team. But another story. And um, so we were, you know, all pooing in the same bucket. And what the Svalbard authorities told us to do, because we're totally remote. You know, there's no sewage works. There's no like electricity, running water like a tap where you just turn the water on and fill up or like you know nothing it's it's literally just a beach and we were living on the beach and we we brought in all of our freeze-dried food and so needless to say there's like 75 people all pooing right every day uh it's a kind of a fact like you know some some people were pooing twice a day and <laughs> it came to me to empty the loot like you know I, guide, leader, whatever. Okay. It's, it's a, uh, you know, we've got maybe lead by example. And it was quite early on in the trip. I was probably like probably four or five days in, um, to what was a, what's going to be uh, an eight week trip to so quite early on actually, you know, wearing your fresh kit, feeling like, you know, just sort of getting stuck in, just settling into beach life. And, um, anyway, the Svalbard authorities had told us that we, uh, should, take our poo bags, our biodegradable poo bags, and um, throw them into the fjord. 
um, you know, just like 10 yards off the shore and then throw stones at them to sink it. And then it would sink and biodegrade at the bottom of the ocean. So it wouldn't like float off and, you know, all go everywhere. Not that, you know, we, not, not that it would really. Uh, anyway, but that's what they wanted us to do. And so my turn came. It was probably like one of the first few times we had to do this emptying, you know, ritual of like throwing stone or throwing it into the into the 10 yards off the shore throwing the throwing stones and sinking so there was quite a crowd developing you know quite a lot of excitement everyone's like oh my god it's george's turn you know just come and watch the poo the, the, the poo bag disappear and um so i limbered up you know can't be quite excited about this made sure the knot was firmly tied and um anyway so sort of, you know stood next to it but like i was gonna do a golf shot swung it back this way and then as I swung through, I think I think about caught a crampon or something on the way through. Or, yeah, I put a crampon, I think, on top of my boot or something. And as I released it, there was this, like, sort of rainbow that formed in front of me. And, like, the onshore breeze just pushed this poo rainbow, like, kind of back onto my face. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there I was, day four of an eight-week project, of an eight-week eight project. Uh, expedition covered in poo, which is perfect. <laughs> and not great access to the showers out there. Uh, there were no showers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, you know, I had a little face wash and washed my hands. Um, I, I guess people were avoiding you for quite a number of days. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, to some animals, right? Rolling in <laughs> poo is like my dog seems to roll in poo all the time. So it seems to be a yeah. bit of a you know, smell nice. And so maybe... You're one with the animals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, salt of the earth. At least, you know, joining in with the animals. Not uh, not apart from nature. I'm a part of nature. I mean, as polar bears go, I'm sure you would be last on their list. <laughs> well, yeah, but possibly. Possibly. We... We shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't joke too much about, we shouldn't joke about that because that was an expedition where one of the kids got killed by a polar bear. I remember. And you may remember in 2011. Um, and I was a guide on that trip. So yeah, I mean, I, yeah, <laughs> we're very, very sad. And the trip, the trip actually ended up um, not lasting the eight weeks um, that we'd intended it to. But, uh, you know, if, again, it was, um, it was a very, very sad for sequence of events. But, uh, you know, we learned a lot and very grateful for, the experience and I, I guess now I, I continue to speak a lot about that expedition both corporately but also sort of privately uh about the leadership and about the 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 mental wellness handling that sort of thing and um you know I really 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 enjoy that because it's it's such a such a unique experience to have to go through an unfortunate experience to have to go through but now being able to share that and help other people is, is really important to me. Good. So I think um, probably without <laughs> going through all these adventures from 2004, what were you like as a child? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm just imagining quite a difficult one that just loves to climb trees, run around, play in puddles, the sort of adventurous child that... We all were. Yeah. Which your mother was probably like, oh, why can't he just be normal? <laughs> yeah. She probably still says the same thing now, to be honest. I'm pretty sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, what? all I can tell you is as a kid, I, I had a lead. <laughs> I had this, these reins, like this thing which you could almost steer me with. Because um, my parents used to travel quite a lot. My dad worked in the US and... Um, so I ended up like flying quite a lot and genuinely in airports I was a complete nightmare because I was like what's that <laughs> and then mum would have to be like come back <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, and uh, so I think I think as a kid I I'm going to say I was like all kids you know I was in, I am like all kids and I and I think this is like not the key to to me for me it's certainly the key for me that's all I can say I can speak for myself can I <laughs> I certainly, as a kid, I remember myself being incredibly inquisitive, incredibly like, not, not um, yeah, always asking like questions, finding new things, looking, um, yeah, curious. I think curious is a is a very good way to describe me. And in fact, 
I've got, you have no idea, this, that's the whole thing about Curious George. I don't know if you came across it, John. Did you come across Curious George? I have heard of Curious George, yes. <laughs> right, he's a monkey which just goes like everywhere and he has a great time. And I read all of his books eight times. And uh, I've, got, <laughs> I've got quite a few teddies um, of Curious George. And uh, I think that's kind of, that sums me up really well. Uh, is that actually I was, you know, just an incredibly curious kid. Um, and always, you say, always climbing trees. <laughs> Sometimes to my detriment. I actually um, remember a little story now that uh, I, I don't know why, but this thing came out of my head. I was like, I wonder whether, so the, there were some cows in the field beneath the tree. And I used to love climbing this one particular tree. And I was like, I wonder whether I could swing on a rope swing and then launch myself and land on the back of a cow, just like Clint Eastwood would do if he rode cows and not horses. And, um, <laughs> and you know, just see what happened. Anyway, uh, I um, didn't quite go to plan, to be honest. I picked up a bit of rope, which was actually just on the floor. And so when I swung out of the tree onto my target, which was, like, you know, the cow was perfectly lined up. I was off. <laughs> I swung out of the tree and just hit the floor <laughs> and I broke my skull um, broke the, the bone in my head, my skull and had to learn to read and write again. So I did quite a good job of that uh, as a five year old, four or five year old. Um, yeah, but it, you know, so as a kid, yeah, I'd say very curious, but then I think um that there's there's a degree of nature versus nurture going on here, isn't there? And on the one side, I'm I'm naturally curious and very keen to like cling on to that curiosity as I grow, get older, yeah. as the inevitable thing, as the inevitable <laughs> passage of time dictates. But I think there was a degree of nurture in there as well, where um, where my parents sort of brought me up with like a a toolbox of 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 um of saying yes of positivity a toolbox where i was taught to say yes and give it my everything give it 110 percent and if i fail don't worry about it kind of learn from it and go on and so that was that's kind of really the person who i am the n naturally curious and inquisitive but I guess my parents had given me that toolbox to be like, yes, go for it. Try, try your hardest, never give up, go for it. You know, all of that, um, that sort of sentiment. I think in some cultures, you know, failure is sort of embraced and in some, maybe the UK, it's sort of frowned upon. I'm a big advocate for learn through failure. I mean, all the sort of big entrepreneurs or the old people who do a lot of stuff they fail in so many, but they just need to learn from those mistakes and eventually they sort of build themselves up. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and it is important. It's so important, I, I think. And it's important for me and my, and my own happiness and satisfaction and, um, and all of that, you know, and fulfillment. Um, and I'm not saying failure is important for that, but I, I, I like to feel like I'm making progress. I'm going somewhere. I'm, you know, I can look back on the year and be like, okay, you know what, well, actually, this has been a really crap year because, because of COVID. But actually, you know, I've, um, I've learned to keep bees. I've learned to bake, as most people have. I've learned to build houses. Um, you know, I've got my HGV test. I've done a few podcasts. I've done a, whatever, you know. And actually then you can pick out the success stories and learn from the failures. Um, it's so, how, you know, I, I'm, I agree. It's how you choose to view your success and failure rather than, you know, looking back on your failure and having that as the sort of main part of your year, you look back and say, Oh, okay, I failed on that. But this is what happened. You look at the positives rather than the negatives. Yeah, absolutely, John. But I also think that, um, that the whole idea of failure is, is also totally up here in the top two inches, you know, that the most powerful thing you own. Yeah. Um, because actually, you know, you, you can, the only person who portrays your failure in different ways is you. I mean, no one else does really. It's just like, oh, well, it didn't work. Uh, or he failed. Or they failed. doesn't matter. Not a big deal. Um, and it's only then in your own head where you're like, you know, I failed. I'm a misery. And, and then you lead yourself off down the sort of the mental, mental route, uh, mm -hmm. mentally, mental instability, unstable route. 
uh, which we've all been down. You know, I'm, I'll be first at my hands up and be like, you know what, I've <clears throat> I've failed, and it's it's sometimes it's cut me super deep, and having to cancel my latest project cut me super deep. You know, I'm yeah, it's been it's been horrific. Um, so I'm first to put my hand up there. Latest projects, um, I suppose it'd be interesting to sort of go into detail because. I know that that project has been four years in the making. And I, I also, I think people listening and watching don't sometimes underestimate how much planning and planning and detail goes into these sort of expeditions. Um, can you tell us a bit about that particular expedition? Absolutely, of course, yeah. <clears throat> so, this um, this was an adventure, like I guess I was super excited about. It was certainly like for me um, the most exciting thing that I had ever done, without a doubt, without a doubt. Um, it we 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 what, what where do I start? Basically, the reason for the for the expedition is that the Arctic Ocean is a very misunderstood place. To such an extent that um, I could almost go as far as saying we know very little about the Arctic Ocean during winter. And um, I almost might go as far as saying that we know about more about the surface of the moon than we do about the Arctic Ocean in winter. Um, and that basically led us, you know, led us to try and reverse that or like change the balance because the Arctic Ocean is absolute is a vital part of our survival, vital part. Uh, because, as I'm sure you know, John, but the both poles, okay, are covered in white, and that's important because it acts as the Earth's natural refrigerator, where the sun's rays are reflected back out away from the sun, away from the Earth, back into the atmosphere, and keep us cool, keep us, you know, within the the sort of temperate uh climate we enjoy and can survive in and as soon as the ice on the arctic ocean is most at risk because antarctica has obviously got altitude to help but the arctic ocean is at sea level and it's just the sea ice which is it's sea ice which is like a crust of ice or floating on top of a huge ocean the arctic ocean and when that ice is gone we then enter like an irreversible negative feedback loop of warming of the Arctic Ocean. It will just not stop absorbing sunlight, basically. So once the ice is gone, it's never coming back. And like, the only the, the one way that I can describe this, and I, I can't describe it more with more like seriousness, aside from saying that once the Arctic ice has disappeared, we will be walking. Oh, sorry. The disappearance of the Arctic ice is a one-way street. There is, there's no like turning round and being like, oh, let's go back down there to go back to how it was, and we had the the ice in the Arctic. No, no, no. It's impossible. It can't happen because of it's a ne it's an irreversible negative feedback loop. It's a one-way street. Um, and so, and it, what seemed peculiar to us was that uh, there was no data. We just don't know very much about it, and there's there's really. That's a huge gap, and so we were heading up to the Arctic Ocean to gather never-before-seen data, content, imagery, research, um, and we would be able to send it back live. So we'd have like I'd be able to do this sort of thing live from the middle of the Arctic Ocean in the depths of winter. I'd sort of pick up the phone, pick up the phone, and show you outside, and there'd be a polar bear there watching in the window of this boat. Uh, it was a decommissioned lifeboat. Um, so, you know, it was a really exciting project, uh, where we would be on the forefront of science <clears throat> and, uh, it was just, I guess, really unfortunate that we didn't manage to get away before COVID, um, cause that would have been phenomenal to be up there as a really positive story for this year. But, um, it sadly wasn't to be, and we got just caught in the, in it basically. And, uh, meant that it really put us, put a big spanner in our works, um, and yeah, as you, you speak correctly about the planning and preparation of this, and uh, you know it's it's huge from from the logistics and operations, from the science partnerships, from the partnerships with brands to 
build the funds to try and you know allow us to buy the boat and redo the boat, build the sledges, train, uh, collect the contents. You know, there's there's just there's, there's so much stuff going on, and uh, yeah, it took the best part of four years from when we first sort of came together as a team and when we then uh, uh, cancelled it finally in July. Um, which was a really, really, or maybe even before that, actually, tiny bit before that, which was really upsetting. But it was the right thing to do at that time because we were just at the link, at the sort of, we were very much at the point where we were just about to have to start to spend money on logistics and operations to get us to the ice, to get the boat to the ice, and all that money is non refundable. Where we were now, we still had a pot of money which we could give back and be like, you know, let's keep that, let's, it'll happen next year, sort of thing, or year after. So is that the hope that it will be picked up next year or the year after? Yeah, as for me, for me, like my, for sure, without a doubt, you know, I'm um, super passionate about that sort of stuff. And uh, I, you know, I, I have no need to go to it near any poles or anything like that or stand there because there's nothing there. So there's no reason to go there. But I really am, I believe passionately in the, uh, in the, in the pursuit of doing these sort of things with a purpose. Yeah. And that for that purpose to be sustainability, um, I think is, 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 is as we all know, it's is suddenly becoming key to our survival. And, uh, and the more people that know about that, the better. And this is sort of why you talk about rewilding humans, which you're sort of passionate about, is that idea of being in nature and actually having the natural habitat still there, still as it is. For future generations yeah man ex- I, exactly um i think even david attenborough spoke about it in his film and um, or his witness statement as he called it um which i'm sure you might have seen or witnessed um but the whole idea of rewilding the planet for me starts with rewilding humans and I, I just i truly believe that that every single one of us have become disconnected from the very essence of why we're here um, and it's, it's taken me like, I guess, 14 years of expeditions where I'd run out of food, live with, you know, had to find tap water to drink and, um, you know, and had to make, keep myself warm and survive, you know, and that, that's what's taken, it's taken me to, that long to realize that. And I don't think that any, I would never expect anyone else to have to go through that to, to understand that. But, but the fact that like the fact that kids nowadays, I, uh, it's a very broad term. But the fact that I, I've actually I've, so I've seen, I've been part of this project, which basically takes kids to farms where they can say, this is where your potatoes come from. They're like, nah, 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 mate. That's, a, that's not right. Potatoes come from, uh, comes from, um, you know, it comes from the Fraser department in Tesco's. And, uh, you know, that, that is so sad and completely wrong. Um, yeah, I mean, well, they're right to a certain extent, but, um, you know, McCain's oven chips, or whatever they're called. Um, I, I think we all, McCain's oven chips and all of us have like a real responsibility to to bring us back to actually what's key to our survival is Mother Nature. And without that, without the sustainability, the sustainable angle, we can't plant crops, we can't pr- produce food, and then we can't have chips in the freezer bin in Tesco's. It won't work. Other supermarkets are available. Um... And until you've created that connection between the outdoors and their life, their survival. Yeah. I remember this story, I think it was on the radio, and the presenter was saying that he he had some chickens out the back and he remembers going to pick up the eggs. And as he was doing it, the neighbor sort of looked up and go, what, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm just taking the eggs to, uh, you know, cook up an omelette or something he goes oh man that's disgusting why don't you just get it from the supermarket <laughs> it's like where do you think the supermarket gets it from <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and um it's it's scary it is really scary really but, scary but also i think as more and more people become urbanized as more people retreat from the countryside into urban areas i know a lot of kids don't have the opportunities to get out to actually experience farmlands and experience, uh, you know, agriculture. I totally agree with you, John. Yeah, 
And so that's that's really the basis of, of my entire mission. Um, it's, you know, through podcasts like this with yourself, through social media, through expeditions, through giving talks, uh, running running events, through companies like uh, I Go Adventures and I guess my new little venture called City Camping, <coughs> um, which I'd love to speak about if we get a second. But, uh, you know, through these all these things, I, I really hope to to have a small impact on a very, you know, on, a, on one person if possible. Because <laughs> uh, uh, I think that, uh, well, I know that because it's, you know, the outdoors has changed my life and changed my, my perspectives on life entirely. I, but I think it can change everyone's lives. Hmm. Um, so city camping, what, what is that? Oh, nice. Um, so city camping is a very exciting, it's very simple. But uh, I was totally struck by uh, a statistic that I heard the other day that said that um, we spend 92% of our lives indoors. But like me and you, you know, surrounded by straight lines and right angles and stuff, you know, and, and pretty ordered. And um, I was like, wow, that's terrifying. And I think that's that's not good at all. And of course, you know, in line with my mission to rewild humans, to get us outside, um, I created this thing called City Camping. And City Camping is all about um getting people to come and spend a night out under canvas under the stars um and so <clears throat> we create totally secure pop-up campsites in city parks and green spaces basically and uh, we're running our first one in september sorry in um uh, in springtime next year in spring 2021 spring summer and uh, we, yeah, we're popping up uh, a campsite in the beautiful Zion Park in central London. It's the largest privately owned park in central London. Um, and so you can get to it for the tube. And we're basically initially targeting kids um, with, with a view to like expand, you know, other nights to other people. So, you know, for example, on the first three night will be first three nights will be kids between 10 and 15. Um, the next three nights will be for, for adults. And then the next two nights will be for corporates or whatever. Uh, but firstly, we're just targeting kids and uh, going through schools to, to get kids between 10 and 15 to come and spend a single night in a tent, which we will provide, um, and to come and just kind of be part of nature for one night. And for me, it was like, I don't know about you, John, but have you ever, did you, do you remember, do you tell us, tell your audience about the first night that you spent in a tent? Can you remember it? My, probably my first memory of camping was probably not a good one. There was a massive storm in the night. I remember waking up of which uh, my parents were next to me when I went to sleep. And when I woke up, no one was around. There was a huge storm coming in. And then I remember sort of waking up. And then as I woke up, the wind had sort of ta taken hold of the tent. And, and the tent ceiling was like here. <laughs> and I can't remember what it was, but it was some pole or something then just smashes me in the head. I run outside probably crying. <laughs> oh, no, John, you're doing terrible for silly camping. Let me tell you about mine. <laughs> My first experience <laughs> was of sleeping out in the garden in a tent. Um, my dad didn't want to sleep outside. So his tactic was to let us go to sleep. You know, we went to bed at 7-ish, 7 7.30, 8 o'clock. And he basically wait until 9 and then get a hose and pretend there was a storm so that we'd all run inside. <laughs> and he was like, perfect, that'll do. <laughs> but, you know, all of these memories are key. And I think there's a large part of... Uh, a large part of everyone, initially children and kids, who are missing out on on this basic fun, basically. And uh, I think you know it is going to be it's going to be basic fun. That's that's literally how I describe it. There's nothing glamorous, nothing except for it's going to be basic, beautiful fun. <laughs> I, th I think as a kid, I was always building dens and stuff, you know, in the playroom or whatnot, putting the two so big sofas together so it'd create a little under. Oh, hundred percent. I still that I've got that set up for me now. <laughs> Is that where you sleep at night? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, oh well, a bit of night time. I just poodle around in it during in my den during the day. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> get some dent paperwork done. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Good. And so with these adventures, because you also did a pretty epic one from Greenland to Scotland. How did that trip come about? Nice. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. I did. Um, uh, that trip, um, how did that one come about? So um, a guy called Patrick Winston, uh, he read a book called Searching for Finman by Norman Rogers. And uh, he was kind of like inspired by this book or like maybe inspired is the wrong word. He was curious about this book. And this book documented uh, an Inuit man who in 1728 landed on the northeast coast of Scotland, right? Uh, he was alone. He was paddling a skin-on-bone kayak, carrying traditional Greenlandic hunting equipment, which, needless to say, I, I hasten to add, you can go and see his kayak and his hunting equipment today in Aberdeen Maritime, Maritime Museum. It's there. Um, and so he definitely landed, right? There's lots of doc lots of documents that that um, talk about these communities of people, sort of Inuit descended people arriving in Scotland in, in the sort of 1700s. Um, and three days later, he died, and but no one knows how or why. But it was believed that this particular person, this particular Finn man, where well, this particular Inuit came from Finnmark. He was called a Finn man because they believed he came from Finnmark in northern Norway. And the problem is that he was carrying traditional Greenlandic hunting gear. So we don't believe he came from northern Norway. We don't believe he was from Finnmark. We believe he came from Greenland. And so we set out, my teammate Ollie Hicks and I, set out to um, unearth this ancient myth and sort of add, add, add speculation, I guess, because we, we couldn't prove or disprove that he did or didn't because we didn't do it in like traditional hunting gear and a skin on bone seal kayak because I think we would have died. <laughs> but um, <laughs> you know, we, we really like added speculation to the fact that he may well have made that journey uh, by, uh, by basically we, we got in a, I mean... <laughs> Nothing more to it, really. We got in a kayak. Um, no, no, like it wasn't really the only additions we made to the kayak was to stretch, was to lengthen it so that I could sleep down inside the co my cockpit. And it wasn't any bigger, any faster. There was no sort of like, uh, not like an ocean, like a rowing boat or an ocean rowing boat where they have like sealed areas at the end of the boat where they can get in out of there and then stay dry because they're sealed capsules. We had none of that. It was genuinely just a kayak, which you could buy from, you know, a sea kayak. Go online, type in sea kayak, and that is what we had. And, um, yeah, we extended it a little bit so that I, I could, because I'm quite tall, I'm, you know, six foot four, so that I could sleep down inside, un underneath the, underneath, inside the, inside the tube. And, yeah, we, we, we paddled from, um, <laughs> from Greenland to Scotland. <laughs> and that's, that's kind of it, really. And so what were you doing? Sort of two hours on, two hours off? Or were you... Yeah. So um, that's quite a common thing, isn't it, for rowers? Yeah. Well, the problem for us is that um, we're a kayak. We are much smaller. And we can't not paddle uh, without having any stability out because uh, we, 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 we rotate. And you can't, have a one per you can't have stability and paddle at the same time. And it was also, more importantly, totally unsustainable for one person to paddle the kayak um, because the kayak was just too heavy. Uh, it would be, it wouldn't be a good use of energy because, as I'm sure you understand, but every single hull, every single like shape of boat, um, a displacement boat, not not a planing hull. So a planing hull goes up on top of the water and planes and goes very quickly. A displacement hull travels through the water and travels very slowly. With displacement hulls, the hull shape has a, a, a particular speed, a hull speed, which it travels at very easily. And if you want it to go any faster, you've got to put in a lot more energy and you don't go much faster because you just end up moving more water. It doesn't work very well. So all displacement hulls have like 
the a, 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 a cruising speed as you as we all think of it. it's just crew you know you can you, you paddle a little bit and you know, you're just you, you get into a rhythm and the boat's traveling at cruising speed perfect but if one person slept uh getting to that cruising and one person paddled maintaining that cruising speed would take all of my effort and i'd be knackered by the end of two hours and it wouldn't be you wouldn't be able to do multiple days of it so long and short <laughs> we both paddled at the same time and we both slept at the same time uh but of course you know i i Again, it's such a hard thing to describe because we're both sitting in the warmth and we're both very comfortable and probably all of your listeners and watchers are. But like, we were always wet. <clears throat> we couldn't stand up. We couldn't walk around. We were inside, a, a, you know, our cockpit. You could just about see the top of your thighs. You couldn't see your feet. When you slept at night, you, just, you went down inside the, co the, the cockpit and you like had to sleep in the coffin position. You couldn't roll over, couldn't roll on your sides. It was so small. It was so cramped. Um, going to the loo. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i think i believe i'm guessing your audience are gonna love uh, well maybe we won't but i think they're probably the type who will enjoy the loo chat going for a pee is quite straightforward bottle piss water over the edge going for a put number two is difficult because you're in a very small space and um, you're wearing like you know bag not baggy clothes but you're wearing like a dry suit and um bear in mind where I sit is also my pillow, uh, it's my office, it's my loo, it's my toilet, it's, every it's everything. So the key, the actual key is to make sure you don't loo when you When you drop kids off at school, right, it's important you don't leave any kids behind because that seat's very important. The seat I'm sitting on is important. So basically we've got a plate and um, with like little edges to keep the kids in and popped it on my pillow and you count like what's going on rough okay I'm expecting roughly this many kids at school and then you kind of pull it out and whoop, chuck it <laughs> chuck it in the sea but believe me it's a proper maneuver uh, to do it um, and yeah the, the only other problem is is that uh, I was the the, the the rear paddler it was a twin kayak and Ollie was approximately four feet in front of me and I had prime view I mean front row seats really if that's what you're after <laughs> of watching um Ollie take a crap <laughs> <laughs> that must have been quite uh and that was what for six weeks uh <laughs> 66 days well how many weeks that is I don't really know so in terms of sleeping though did you have sort of chuck boys over the side to stabilize the kayak as you slept yeah so exactly we looked at a whole load of things, like we looked at doing riggers. So yeah. we had the sort of what was effectively what was going to be our paddle, yeah. and then we attach to the ends of our paddle floats, and then we um, put the paddle onto the deck in two places, and then you've kind of got outriggers to keep you upright, if you L like, like a trimaran or something. Yeah, like a trimaran. But of course, the problem is one, it's your paddle that's being used. Two, you're putting a hot loads of stress through these two points on the boat. And if they break, uh, if one of those points, you know, that's attached to your kayak break, you've then basically got a hole in your only survival, in your only, you know, structure, which is going to keep you alive and dr vaguely dry. Um, so that was really not a wise move. So in the end, what we had was so simple. We had um, mast floats from the top, from, you know, on some dinghies, they have a float especially on catamarans, like darts. Yeah. They have a float on top of the mast, and that's to stop, when they capsize, that's to stop the mast, it's to stop them inverting, because of course they're a catamaran with two hulls, and when they invert, they're very hard to get back upright again. Um, so th there's a float on top of the mast, which stops it from going you know, underwater, keeps it like this, uh, when it's capsized. And this mast, this mast float, it's basically like 40, I think it's like 40 litres of, of air with a, with a string. We attached a string to the bottom of it. And what we did was we took, we had uh, four floats and two at the back, two at the front. And the two at the back, I obviously fixed and the two at the front, Ollie fixed. But basically what we did was we take one float and we pass the string und underneath the kayak 
okay, and pull it so that the, the float went down to the water level and then we tie it on this side. And then we do exactly the same. So float on this side, pass the string under the kayak, pull it up till the float hits the water and then tie it on this side. And then you've kind of got like two floats either side. Um, and that's what we did. But like the, the one thing we never tested because I think really, the truth be told, we were terrified to find out what the consequence could be, was test what would happen, whether we could get out, whether we could escape the boat, if it capsized when we were asleep. Right. Uh, and I don't think the answer would have been very pleasant. And that's probably why we, that's why we never tested it, because you know, I think it would have been a mental thing then. God. Um, wow. That's uh, certainly quite the trip. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm sure. I'm sure, um, pe I'm sure people I'm listening. Sure people are just listening, like, I just like to sleep like in the coffin position every night for six weeks. I mean, they must be thinking, what sort of entices you to find that enjoyable? Yeah. So just to be clear, we um we went from Greenland to Iceland, and then we around the outside we paddled the kayak around the outside of Iceland. So we were sleeping on the beaches. Yeah. And then we went from Iceland to the Faroe Islands, but of course there's you know there's big stretches of ocean in between these, and it's like all of none of all of these legs from Greenland. I say all of them from Greenland to Iceland had never been kayaked, from Iceland to the Faroes had never been kayaked, uh, but from Faroes to Scotland had been kayaked before, um, but very like once or twice before, um, I think maybe even once actually. But details, you know, still. Sleeping inside the boat is pretty pretty horrendous and quite and actually terrifying. You know, it's like Chinese water torture when like there's a drip which just and it's raining outside, and it just drips on your head, you know, it's hard to get to sleep. But you know what? What 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 keeps me going back? What what do I love about it? And it might sound so weird and like really hard for you to understand. But I still would wake up in the morning um whilst kayaking, you know, and I mean what <laughs> Ollie take a shit in front of me. Uh, <laughs> and uh, still I was you know, incredibly grateful for the experience that I'd probably go as far as saying this many humans maybe on the planet have ever experienced certainly there was no other human apart from Ollie who had seen, who had seen the sights and views um, saw the wildlife, met the people, you know, th there's just so many things which, and em emotions and feelings, which I'll never, ever, ever forget. Um, and so many beautiful scenes and landscapes and vistas. And I, you just, I think the, the reasons for it are, are endless. And I can't see any other reason. I can't see a reason why I would not, um, do something similar. I'll, I'll give you a free piece of advice. I will never kayak across the North Atlantic Ocean again. Um, you know, I think I think the risk profile was super narrow, and like Ollie and I were inherent, were totally aware of this. Like the 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 risks involved in kayaking across the North Atlantic Ocean are vast. You know, it's a it's a ferocious patch of water which we kayaked across, and your margin for error is, is minuscule. Because, you know, I'm paddling along, I'm fed, watered, and I'm warm. I'm fine. I'm alive. All good. And the next second, you'd be upside down by a rogue wave fighting for your life. There's no, like, middle ground. There's no kind of, like, on another expedition, for example, you know, a car walking the longest unsupported polar journey. Actually, if things kind of start to go wrong, you can sort of see it and hopefully bring it back. But actually, this with the kayaking situation... You know, we were alone. We had no support vessel. Um, it was, you can go and check it out. It was Red Bull filmed it. I could go and type into Red Bull or go onto my, my Instagram or whatever or Facebook and on my website even and have a look. But, you know, uh, just the margins for error were so, so, so fine. And I think that we were, I really do think there was a bit of luck involved uh, in it. And I, I, maybe if you've got a second, I'd, maybe I'll tell you the story about our luck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go for it. Um, and, and so the whole idea of, of, of luck, I think, uh, isn't to be relied on, of course, you know, I, <laughs> but, 
but um, I, I, I also think there was someone, must have been someone looking over us because, as I said, we had nobody with us. We touched Iceland for the last time, touched the hard ground, baff, and paddled towards the horizon. We were off. Our next stop was across, we were, our next destination was into the middle of the ocean, paddling across a patch of ocean called the Devil's Dance Floor. Um, so called because it's where the southerly flowing Arctic currents meet the northerly flowing Gulf Stream. The ocean shallows become shallower and the, the surface, um, like the sea state, becomes horrendous sometimes. And so we touched Iceland for the last time. It was a very foggy day. Fog is incredibly disorientating, even when you're like on land. Um, but let alone when you're at sea, when there is there's zero landmarks. There's zero, zero like markings. There's not trees or bushes or buildings which you can orientate yourself off. In the fog, it is totally disorientating. You feel like you're paddling in circles, and you have to trust your compass. You have to trust. Like, okay, I'm heading north now. Let's keep going. Still heading north. I'm not doing circles. I swear. You know that is like what this thing does to you. Can make you believe you're paddling in circles. Anyway, the we got about four days into this crossing. We were probably about seventy miles off Iceland. So Iceland had long since disappeared. Faroe Islands was another four hundred miles, I think, um, across. So you know we were probably just under a quarter of the way. Um, <laughs> optimistic, but whatever. <laughs> And um, we weren't travelling as quick as we needed to, to be honest with you. We were like staring down the barrel of like rationing, of, of doing everything we can to make sure we got to the safety of the beach, of this 400 yard wide beach in the Faroes. Genuinely, it was going to be a survival story, I think, this crossing. And um, our plan was to get on the back of a weather system. Now, the weather is obviously, we were hugely dependent on the weather for this uh, kayaking journey because we're so small. We have a, a, a freeboard, which is about three inches. And a freeboard is basically the, the amount of, the height you are above the water before the water starts to come into the boat. But it wouldn't because we've got a splash deck on. But, you know, like that's how, uh, if, it, if we have a three, more than three inches of water wave, it comes over the deck, basically. And uh, our plan was to get on the back of this, um, this storm. Anyway, because we were travelling slower than we thought, we got caught in a storm. Or we were about to be. And so, morning of day three. I think the scene has been set. Morning of day three. Uh, it was very quiet at sea. Almost deafeningly quiet. Like, kind of like... I mean, I can't even make it quiet here because I've got like a clock ticking. <laughs> but like deafeningly silent ollie just done his paperwork just been for a poo and it's just floated past me i'd offered some sort of feedback as to his constituency and how he needs to chew his sweet corn a bit more and um suddenly i hear the sound of an engine and we're 75 miles offshore right it's pretty nice not quite nice but, you know there's waves and we are you know our bodies are three foot tall off the water and like we disappear behind every wave. And I hear the sound of an engine. I was like, Ollie, can you hear that? Just me and, him, me and Ollie out there, no one else. Can you hear that, Ollie? And he's like, yeah, can you hear it? I can hear an engine. Anyway, it was a, Nor um, a Norwegian. It was a Icelandic fishing boat. And uh, they were just fishing, right, normally. And they happened to see us. And this comes up in the full length feature, the 52 minute documentary. It is extraordinary. Like, when one of their pe people saw us, which is so unlikely, you have no idea how quickly, when you're three foot above the surface, your head is three foot above the surface, the highest point of the kayak, you disappear. You know, you get on different wave patterns and suddenly you're gone. You're, you're lost at sea. So easy to happen. And so the fact that they saw us was a miracle. They came over to us and... Um, <laughs> This, this guy came out of the portal on the side where they bring their fish in. It was a small fishing boat, not particularly big, like I think 30, 40 foot long. Not a huge one. But he, this guy came out of this Icelandic guy, right? And he looked like Thor, mate. He looked like Jesus. He had like a beard that was like catching his shoelaces. 
and he's Icelandic and he goes what are you doing like this bellows at us and the whole like Jesus Christ you know like Dumbledore all the, all the air like moves what are you doing and Ollie and I are like um, looking at ourselves uh, we're kayaking <laughs> and um, he was like where are you from we're like England he's like aha makes sense <laughs> crazy man anyway uh, he then said that um he then like the next words were very concerning and these guys are fishermen they've been fishing in these waters for like nearly 30 years i think what the captain had and he said you know there is a storm coming um and uh yeah he said that between 40 to 60 knots of wind wind is key at sea you know it's like it's it's what it's what stirs up the, the sea state and makes it dangerous 60 knots is a hurricane and they happen quite a lot at sea we don't necessarily we don't generally hear about them very often because it's not important it's not going to affect humans so we don't know about it but they happen a lot 60 knots a hurricane and it's guaranteed death in a kayak basically and ollie and i were faced then with a decision they were like you know do you want to come back with us um ollie and i looked at each other and this is like our survival. He, this this is like a guy telling us we're going to die. Okay. Yeah. And by the way, this, yeah, it's, it's extraordinary. And Ollie and I said to him, no, thanks. No, thanks for your help. We declined the offer of their help. And the reason we did was because we believed in our team. We, we had made a decision to leave when we left Iceland we were not expecting this boat to turn up and offer us this solution. So we yeah. committed to our team back then. We'd already made a decision. And I think there's lots of notes of trust, of teamwork, of you know how important every, per every person is in a team there, but that's not for today. Um, but also like that commitment, that dedication to our cause. Like, there's lots of notes in there that I'd love to speak about more often, but I might have to send you an invoice. <laughs> but... Um, um, Oli and I said no to our only chance of survival. Fact. And we paddled on towards the Faroe Islands. And the fishermen went back to their fishing. And they genuinely believed that they were going to be the last people to see us alive. And they said this to, to the cameras. You know, afterwards, they're like, we thought they were, they were going to die. We thought we were going to be picking up a boat and looking for bodies later that day. So... They went back to their fish. We paddled on towards Iceland and disappeared again. Poof, gone. You know, miles apart. That maybe like three or four hours. Three or four hours had passed, and off we were. Ollie and I were cracking on, and you know, Faroe Islands was our next. This four hundred yard patch of beach, which, which is, you know, yeah, as I said, four hundred kilometers away. Um, we were aiming for tiny, really. Three hours later, we heard the sound of an engine again. They'd come back to look for us potentially trying to find like the boat, the upturned boat and dead bodies possibly. But they'd come back to find us. And a miracle, once again, they found us. Mir miraculous. In an ocean, it's, a, it's huge. I, I, the fact that they found us once is a miracle. The fact they found us twice is, I don't know, there must have been some sort of divine intervention in here. Uh, for those of you who've been at sea, you'll know it is a huge place. It's huge. And featureless. They found us and um, they said to us, we've spoken to the Coast Guard and they really want us to come in. I want you to come with us and we really want you to come with us. This is your last chance. So Ollie and I said, can you wait five minutes, please? And they said, of course, um, kindly. And so we called our weather forecasters again and we had a, an, an American, we had a Scotsman <laughs> and we had a Welshman, all right? And we said to them, look, you can see the weather. You know everything about how fast we can travel. You know everything about how much we can manage in terms of weather. Um, would you get on the boat or not? And um, the Yank was like, yeah, dude, it's, it's looking pretty bad, to be honest. Much worse than we thought it was going to be. So if I were you, I'd, I'd get on the boat. Probably a good idea, right? So there's three people who want us to get on the boat. Oh, five. The Scotsman was like, Hi, pal. It's looking pretty bad out there. Like, I think you should get on the boat. I, I, I do. I do. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. We made a mistake. Um, not quite sure where he's from. Ullapool area. <laughs> and then the Welshman from Cardiff goes, 
oh no boys don't you worry crack on it'll be all right <laughs> anyway 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 um we we had five decisions four of them wanted us to get on the boat and so uh, we got on the boat and um we lived with the we had our kayak on the roof and and we lived with the fishermen they had a luckily had a crane on the roof so they actually just craned it onto the roof you know it's a big old boat and we lived with the fishermen for the next week catching cod uh, from Icelandic fishing waters for uh, we were laying I think 10 miles of fishing line 20,000 hooks each day long lining catching cod for um, British supermarkets I mean what an experience what an unbelievable experience they dropped us back in Iceland and then (laughs) We paddled on and landed in Scotland weeks later. But, but, you know, like, what an experience. And what a story of luck and of, I don't know, divine intervention. Call it what you like. Good fortune. I have no idea what it was. But I think, I think, um, yeah, and I will maintain to, to the day that I die that they did not rescue us. Because, yeah. um, what was I going with this? I, because, oh, yeah. Because we will never know what would have happened if we carried on. Um, we would never have known whether we would have made it or not. Um, so, you know, whether that was the right decision or the wrong decision to get on the boat, I don't know. All I can tell you is that getting on the boat was a correct decision. It wasn't the correct decision, but it was a correct decision. And I think, again, dangerous sending you an invoice but there's lots of chat about like decision making and how it looks and (laughs) and all of that but yeah god what a story especially to spend a week uh you know what's uh ben fogel's program life of the wild or something where he goes and does sort of really yeah go you had that experience for a whole week catching cod right i mean it was truly extraordinary. We had a few, there's a few more of these experiences that happened on that trip. Genuinely, a few more. But I mean, remarkable, <laughs> remarkable. Yeah, what a story. Um, so there's a part of the show where we ask the same five questions to each guest each week. Uh, with the first, with the first one being, what's the one bizarre thing that you crave or miss from home when you're out doing these expeditions? <clears throat> What's the, uh, the biggest thing that I crave and miss? You know what? I, th- I, think I, I think I miss and therefore appreciate how simple and straightforward life is. Um, certainly when you're up in the Arctic and it's pitch black and you're like, you know, all the drills and the discipline of trying to keep your kit as dry as possible from sweat, um, like sleeping inside a plastic bag and, you, you know, everything's frozen. Like my oh mate, I, there's so much more I, I could speak for hours about this, but like the discipline, the constant focus uh, that you need to survive on expeditions. I think one of the things which I appreciate more than anything, and therefore probably miss, is just how simple and straightforward our lives are today. You know, I got up this morning. I got up this morning, and I I barely even thought about you know getting out of bed. Walking into the bathroom, having going to the loo, brushing my teeth, putting some clothes on, making my bed, going downstairs, having breakfast. I was like, "This is it was a doddle." I put the kettle on, made myself a cup of tea, had a bowl of cereal, um, you know, and then turn my computer on. I, I have thought nothing. I've done. I've let my brain engage zero, zero, nothing. And so I think, of course, I miss like friends and family, and then, of course, I miss all the niceties and the delicious food and the. And the um, and the uh, and everything else. I think probably that everyone else would say they miss. Of course, I have that. I miss that. But I think like, at its core, at its base, at its most basic, it's the, just how simple life is. Um, how simple we have life. Which, on the flip side, leads me to appreciate where I am on expedition because. Life is also simple here because I, all I've got to worry about is whether I'm fed, watered, and warm. And so, like, there's, I'm going to worry about the Wi-Fi connection, how many e-meetings I've got that day, or um, you know, how many podcasts I've got to record, or whatever, or how many likes I've got on Instagram. You know, so what? 
that sort of what I've just created there is a situation where I'm very grateful for being on expedition because it's very simple, but also because I actually, what I love about being at home is how simple it is. So you're kind of like quite, quite weird, but hopefully I've explained that well is I really do miss how simple life can be in both situations. And I think it leads me into a very deep appreciation and gratitude for everything that I have, whether I'm on expedition or whether I'm at home. I think um, with that, it's by doing these sort of trips and expeditions, you suddenly realize that you don't need much. You, ju- it's, you can live such a sort of simple life when you're back here. I mean, on expeditions, you need a few little gadgets here and there, but sometimes just the simple things that make such a huge difference. And I'm right with you there. Um. What is your favorite adventure book? Um. <laughs> uh, my serious answer would be um, a book, uh, The Worst Journey in the World, Absolute Jerry Garrard. That's quite that's an amazing book. Um, the amusing one would be like The Adventures of Curious George. Have you got a teddy bear for us later? <laughs> I could get it. It's up in my room. <laughs> Genuinely, I'm not lying to you. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll get him at the end. Okay. Uh, what is your inspirational figure growing up? Interesting question. I I don't think I really have like one inspiration. Um Maybe that's a irregular thing to say, but I don't think that I have one person who I look up to and say, I want to be like him. I, I, sort of, I look at David Beckham and say, I want to be like him. I think you want to be what like I David look Beckham? up to in people, irrespective of their, of their stature, whether they're the king or queen or whether they're not, uh, what I look up to in people is finding, is finding fulfillment. Um, and that probably sounds very wholesome. <laughs> But, you know, I, I look up to people who, who found, like, satisfaction and happiness because actually that's really, at the end of the day, what's really important. <laughs> um, you know, your health, your happiness, and I, they're all so inextricably linked that you know, even if, I, I don't want to, um, I don't really know how to, how to say this, but whatever end of the spectrum you're at, whether you're a king or queen or whether, you, whether you're... Um, you know picking up horse poo for a living like if it is what you love uh, then and you found satisfaction in that and it and it and it makes you happy and you found a balance in life i think you should pursue that with everything you've got and those are the people that i look up to um so you're absolutely right you heard me correct if if i look up to that person who picks up poos for sure i look up to that person who who is in banking and is, is happy and earning all that money and has got it sorted you know, and, and has found that balance. I look up to both of them because I think actually the banker is often more unhappy than the person who picks up boots for a living. Genu- and I think we can find quite a few cases of that. You know, and it's not linked to the size of that. Well, it is linked to the size of that wallet because they obviously have different size wallets, metaphorically speaking. But I think finding that that balance is what I would look up to and respect without having to name anybody in particular. What about favourite quote or motivational quote? Oh, I've got heaps of those, but I've got heaps of those, maybe. Um... <clears throat> well, reel, reel them off, reel them off. <laughs> well, we've spoken a lot today about... We've spoken a bit, well, a lot. We've spoken a bit today about failure. Um, so one of my favourites is Winston Churchill. And he says that success is the ability to go from failure to failure without losing your enthusiastic enthusiasm. And uh, yep. boy, I'm enthusiastic. <laughs> um, so that's a good one. Um, we've also spoken quite a lot today about sort of um, happiness and the balance and I think maybe living life to the full. Yeah, exactly. And I think uh, this will be my last one I give you today, but it's um it's a it's a fabulous quote, and I think it really speaks to um, me and my values, and like maintaining that sense of curiosity 
and love of and the sort of love of life, if you like, um, which which I which I thoroughly endorse. And it's a quote by um, well, I don't know whether it was him, but Hunter Thompson, and uh, he said that life shouldn't be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving in a in a pretty and like perfectly formed body. Instead, instead, uh, rather, it should be a journey to the grave where you skid in broadside in a cloud of smoke, thoroughly used up, totally worn out and proclaiming what a ride. And that really, for me, like the whole concept of skidding into my grave broadside is like, I, you know, I might even call, call my book like skidding in broadside or something like that because it is, I, you know, I, I have no intention. As this, this guy, I don't want to arrive perfectly and pretty. You know, I want to like fill every day like, I mean, another quote coming out here, but I want to fill every day like it's my last because, because one day, I don't know which day, but one day I'm going to be right. Yeah, I think that was Steve Jobs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Someone like that, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's a good quote. I like that. Um, <laughs> don't know if uh, this is a good thing. <laughs> As you were saying that when you sort of said perfectly formed, I sort of, one of my favorite quotes is actually Hannibal Lecter, where he says that the scars are to remind us that the past was very real. It's like the more scars you have, they all tell a story. But I'm not sure if Hannibal yeah, Lecter is a yeah, great yeah, so sort of have... guy to sort of quote. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Everyone's like, oh, and this one, and, and this one, you know. <laughs> um, people listening are always keen to travel and go on these sort of big, grand adventures. What's the one thing you would recommend them to do to get them started? My one piece of recommendation is keep it simple, stupid. Without a doubt, without a doubt. If you want to get started, keep it simple. Um, you know, uh, there's I, there's lots of advice about sort of funding and not trying to go big and go great and break records in day one. Keep it simple. Like, you know, go out, do what makes you happy, make sure you enjoy it um, and build from that. There's no need to do big grand things first up. Go and walk up a Scottish hill. If you hate it, well then probably don't bother going and trying to break a record there okay start simple start small but make sure you start yeah no, i agree and finally what are you doing now and how can people follow your adventures in the future yeah cool there's there's heaps going on really um for me like whether it's in the adventure world whether it's more like business focused around city camping or i go adventures or bullard's gin um, or, you know, me giving talks or representing brands. So there's, there's like loads of stuff going on, which is really exciting, all singing to the same, like rewilding humans. And, uh, I think where well, you can follow me first of all online is a great way to follow me on Instagram. Um, I'm proud of where I'm most active, probably not so much on Twitter and those sort of places and Facebook, but yeah, jump on Instagram. I'm all there. Uh, I have a website too. Um, you know, in terms of what's next, uh, what I'm most excited about next is city camping. I think that's going to be really fun, and I hope that we get lots of lots of kids this year for our for our week in the spring summer of 2021, and we 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 sort of display a great proof of concept so that we can um, take it all over the UK. Um, so that's next. Other other expeditions that'll be coming out uh, in Ducal. I'm about to go and sail sail a boat. We're meant to be sailing across the Atlantic, but we had to switch that one and not sail across the Atlantic this time. So, you know, you know, it's all up in the air, really, on the travel side of things. But who knows? Who knows? You better follow along. You better follow along to stay tuned, didn't you? That's right. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. And, yep, yeah, check out uh, George's Instagram and website. And you can follow his adventures for the next future. And City Camping, that's the next one. Well, yeah, City Camping, I Go Adventures. Yeah, just check it out. Have a great time. <laughs> keep smiling amazing thank you so much John it's been a pleasure thank you for having me on well uh, we'll catch up for a beer soon I hope I hope so too <laughs>